there's nobody like the Macho Man. Outrageous, flamboyant. Wow, he just exploded onto the scene. It's my time, Macho time. His only companion was cocaine. It wasn't too light. It's not the end of his time. They told him, you're going to end up dead in the street one day. Nosotros sabemos que fue el que lo mató. It is macho time this Friday when Showtime Sports delivers another hard-hitting documentary, Macho, the Hector Camacho story. It's getting me fired up, your boy Brian Campbell right here. Let's bring in Eric Draft. You know this guy if you like boxing documentaries, and I know you do. Uh, how about Nomas 30 for 30? How about that a great assault in the ring doc a few years back? Eric, you're the, the director, the voice, the man behind this great Hector Camacho story. Thanks for joining us. It gets me fired up because as a kid in the 80s, I knew Tyson, I knew Sugar Ray Leonard, and you're damn right I knew Camacho. And when he would come on the TV screen, it was like somebody giving me candy. I, you could not take your eyes off of him. What is your emotional connection to him to want to start this project? Well, probably close to the same as, as you just described. I mean, you know, there was a moment in time, you know, basically in 1986, you know, the Rosario fight being a perfect example, because I just looked at the original poster where, you know, there's a big picture of Camacho on the front of the poster. And guess who's on the uh, undercard and just his title, Mike Tyson. Yeah. So there was a moment when Hector Camacho owned the sport of boxing and rightfully so. I mean, you know, he had this charisma, this character, this showmanship that that so few really have. I mean, you got a lot of great talented fighters and you got good showmen. But when you mix that together, it's the perfect salad. And that's what Camacho was. And that's what was appealing to me too, growing up, probably I'm around the same age as you, you know, watching boxing. And, you know, honestly, there was a time I just wanted to see him get beat. And, <laughs> you know, he was just so in your face. But I think that the best fighters out there, there's usually an equal amount of fans that want to see him lose as that want to see him win. Absolutely. It's hard to be a super nice guy in a sport of, of combat, you know? And, and to give you credit here, I mean, you're a two-time Emmy Award winner, so you don't need too many pats on the back. But in the film, which I had a chance to see, you really are able to do two things at the same time, which I think is key. One, give us an archival, nostalgic perfect summation of a great fighter's career which featured as we mentioned times when he was absolutely on top and a hero times when he's like a trolling villain pay-per-view b-side looking to cash checks that's great that's half of the doc the other half is the you know the investigational reporting side on the real man his character we know boxers have the best life stories because uh you, you can't script those it's real and his life and death certainly fit that category. When you're looking to take on a new project, and I laid out there that you know, you've know you done some great ones already, how much did the unsolved nature of the Hector Camacho murder and that whole side of the story really draw you to want to attack this? Well, I think that there was a personal, first there was a personal connection to Macho. I happened to be very good friends with one of the executive producers, Mike Acri, who is a legendary insider in the boxing world. Most people don't know his name, but he was behind Duran. He was behind Camacho. Just one of those unsung great guys, a brilliant boxing mind. And he was Camacho's uh, promoter. So I got the chance to meet Camacho uh, when I was a journalist at Fox back all the way in 1997 when, at the, uh, the Leonard fight. So I was around him. I got to see him. I got to, to, to be part of that. And of course, I knew his son later on when I started working in the boxing world, Junior, who's a talent on his own. And so I was working uh, down in Panama on No Mas, and I was interviewing Roberto Duran, and uh, Camacho had been killed uh, maybe two months beforehand, and so it was still really fresh. And, and I remember seeing on the, the ticket, uh, the, 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 the news uh, um, uh, tape everywhere, the trackers that, you know, he had died, and it, and it garnered national attention. It wasn't just like, oh, boxer dead. This was Hector Camacho, and I could really get the, 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 the omnipotence of his life 
by how many national networks covered it. But anyway, I was with uh, Duran and I asked Duran about it. And Duran, this man of steel, you know, the, the, the most macho of all Latino fighters started to cry. And at that moment, wow. I knew that his impact was significant, not just on the sport, not just on Latinos, but on, on our country. And so going back to your question in a roundabout way, I went to uh, Puerto Rico right, after, right afterwards, it was 2013. Junior was still living in the apartment of his father. And I was sure that the murder was gonna be, you know, the murders were gonna be brought to justice. I mean, you can't just shoot somebody as, you know, assassin style in, in broad daylight and get away with it. And, you know, one year went by, two years went by, and I was working on a lot of other uh, projects. So I, you know, I needed, I, I just felt compelled to tell the story. And when I found out that, you know, his murders had not been brought to justice, I knew that that was what I had to do. I had to tell this story because his family was still grieving. The boxing world was still grieving. And I didn't want his story to be lost in history as just another fighter with an unsolved murder. So that's really what started the, uh, the, the journey and, and, uh, and got me to want to make this documentary. Uh, the one thing I must say is that even though I delved into the investigation and I've got hours of footage, which I might, you know, we might, who knows, we might make into another part about all the circumstances of the crime, the assassins. I went to Florida, I chased down neighborhoods and got people, which is some of it's in the movie, but a lot of it's not. I found that I couldn't get to the great Mancini bout. I couldn't great get to Pazienza. I couldn't get to his great moments in the ring because I was too far away doing the murder investigation. So that's how it started. And that's how come it, you know, became kind of a uh, amalgamation of both. Now, when you're poking around in, in your, your leg work on this, I really have to, you know, tip my cap to you of, of going down to Puerto Rico, digging up contacts, information, uh, pressing the authorities and, you know, and, and, uh, do you get pushback when that happens? I mean, you're, you're already embedded with the family and now you're almost trying to solve the crime in some ways for the authorities. What is that like the pressure that ends up coming on you as a filmmaker in that spot? Uh, you know, it's, 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 you, I felt compelled to do it for the family. I felt like, you know, we needed these answers and yeah, I got, I mean, I must've gone to the police stations, the local police stations a dozen times. And in the, the first time I went, I got the, the answer. It's a, it's a closed investigation. We're working on it. You know, many people, and this was after Maria, many people left, many of the suspects left after Maria. Every time we went and got a different answer, but you know, there's the power of the camera, the power of the press, and thank God for the press. And, you know, I'm a journalist when I, when I boil it, I like to think of my myself as a journalist and I'm looking for facts and looking for truth. So, uh, you know, I just didn't stop digging. I had a contact uh, through an old high school buddy of mine at the FBI. And, uh, you know, and I was dealing with some CD or, you know, people that work within the CD underworld, some investigators. And I kept digging and digging and digging. And I, like I said, we got a lot of information that's not in the movie, but that is germane to the murder. And, you know, sometimes they'll know the murderer and then they have a hard time making the arrest because of evidence. Yeah, it's 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 a very uh, you know without wanting to give away any of the twists and turns, it's a very compelling watch. Aside from just wanting to tune in and, and go deeper on who Macho was as a as a showman, but as a man too. I mean, look, this was a guy obviously with the way he lived and died had a lot of personal demons. Uh, how easy was it to talk to his friends and the family and sort of get the real story about what was chasing him personally? And how hard it was to, to maintain this, this macho lifestyle, you know, this lifestyle that ultimately killed him, it seems. Well, you know, the family was extraordinary. You know, uh, really, if you want to find the spirit of uh, Hector Camacho alive and well today, it's in, in his mother. You know, it probably it started in his mother, of course. Maria is this unbelievable, charismatic, excitable, vi vibrant person. And, uh, and that's where he got it from. And uh, so once I got to the family, um, 
I was able to kind of start to connecting dots and people want to know, people want to find out the truth. They want to be able to, to have some closure. So getting to the family was good. And they were very forthright, as you'll see in the movie about his demons, you know, uh, you know, sometimes people are so, you know, uh, nervous about keeping things exposed that they don't want to say something on camera. But I found his family to be very open. I found the Puerto Rican community to be exceptionally open, loving, generous with their time, with their resources, with their pictures, with their memories. So it was a really great experience. And I think Puerto Rico deserves this. You know, I was talking to uh, Lou DiBella, who's also an executive producer in the beginning. And I was saying, well, I'm like, you know, Camacho might not have been the best Puerto Rican fighter out there. I mean, you got Trinidad, you got Cotto, you got Vasquez, you know, a lot of great, great Calderon. You got a lot of great fighters. Yeah, yeah, but but what, what Lou said is like, yeah, but Camacho was the hero of their streets. And he, you know, warts and all, you know, we like to see our heroes be human and do great things, like a Marvel hero. We don't want just this perfect everything. If we see the perfect uh, hero, we almost want to see him fall a little bit. We want to know that there's something human about him. And Camacho was very human. And I think that's why he is the human, the hero of the streets. Yeah, I mean, to see the reaction and the archival footage uh, that that maybe we didn't see when we followed, you know, the, the the tragic loss and murder, to see the people's reaction from Puerto Rico to New York to just, I mean, it's like Elvis. It was really, uh, it was really incredible, and it, it's a it's a tip of the cap to culturally, obviously, what uh, what Hector Camacho meant. Uh, to talk about his career for a second it always felt like there were two different fighters and, and it seems like the Ros Edwin Rosario fight was that turning point when you dug deeper and, and talked to Rosario and talked to the others there, how integral was that fight in changing Hector's style in, in flash in the ring? Yeah, certainly, you know, when you look at the totality of his career, you kind of see he fought everybody. I mean, he had almost 80 fights. I mean, this is a guy who like was out at, at the highest level. This is not, you know, someone who is just barely holding on. He, he, he actually stood toe to toe with the best out there. But I would say that Rosario was the demarcation of a change in his career. He went from this superstar, this young, lovable guy who had so much talent and who could bang, who, who had unbelievable footwork, to a guy who got his, his, you know, his deck clock in that fight. And at that moment is when a lot of boxing people say this is when he changed styles and he became more of a dancer and a defensive style as fighter. And, you know, boxing fans don't like that. You know, as much as Floyd Mayweather has got the best record and is a great fighter, you know, he's not that exciting. You know, people want exciting fighters. They want to, they want a Toro Gatti. They want people to go in there. They want Chavez. They want macho fighters to go in there and toe to toe. And Camacho realized that he could be in there, but he didn't want to, he didn't have to take all that abuse like he used to. Uh, and like he was uh, made aware of at Rosario. So I think that he went from this like superhero to almost like a super villain. And, uh, and, and, and it hurt him. A lot of people turned on him uh, and a lot of his own fans were like, come on, you're a dancer. So I think that definitely tainted his overall reputation. It's crazy because he won that fight and he won it courageously, yet it had such a negative effect on his future. Uh, look, we love flashy guys. I mean, like I said, when I was a kid, it was like I could not get enough of a, I thought of Camacho like I thought of a Jim McMahon or eventually a Deion Sanders. It's like, look at me. So when we see somebody today like a Conor McGregor, I think it's safe to say, oh, I can see some pretty boy if Floyd, Money Mayweather, and I can see a little Ali. Uh, do you see elements in today's stars that you feel like maybe they got from Camacho? You know, I think one of the reasons we're even talking about Camacho and Camacho was Camacho was because he was authentic. He was authentic to himself. He believed in those costumes and those personas that he would go out and walk out in, uh, into the ring with. Uh, funny story, you know, he was with his wife, Amy, and they went to this, uh, um, this shoe store. And he looks at those shoes and he says, oh, I like those. And, and the sales lady said, oh, those are for women. He said, oh, okay. And they walk out of the store and Camacho gives Amy a hundred dollars and said, go get, go back and get me those in size 10. You know, he, and then she said later, I, I couldn't go out with him because he wore more fishnet than I did. Camacho owned it. 
He owned it. He, he wasn't in fishnet in the dark shadows in a hotel room. He was walking around outside, you know, living his life, his, his, his pure life. Yeah. Shout out to Oscar De La Hoya's fishing nuts as well. Another topic for another day. Uh, Eric, I've loved uh, the, the projects you've come across. I mean, that assault in the ring was a gritty film about such a dark moment, certainly in, in recent boxing history, no Moss Duran Leonard, it sold itself. Um, people are going to become fans of you because they know you chase after the great stories. Do you got anything on the, on the oven that you're working on or any projects you want to hit? in your future well how do you how do you top this how do you follow this uh, i've got one that i'm working on that i can't really talk about right now because it's a super competitive field out there but i promise you i'm on the case for one that's going to be really exciting really important and goes over some some decades of 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 great entertainment and sport so and i'd be i'd love to come on your show and talk about it as soon as i lock it all all down Excellent. Let's do that thing. Your track record's been uh, phenomenal. You're a great, uh, great protector of this great, shitty, amazing, <laughs> dirty, broken, beautiful sport that we love. I love the stories that you tell. It's Friday, showtime, December 4th, 9 Eastern and Pacific. It's called Macho, the Hector Camacho story. Eric Drath from Emmy Awards to this show. Great talking to you, man. Uh, I love the piece. I love the movie. I, I know people are going to do the same. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. There's nobody like the Macho Man. Outrageous, flamboyant. Wow, he just exploded onto the scene. It's my time, Macho time. His only companion was cocaine. It wasn't too light. It's not the end of his time. I told him we're gonna end up dead in the street one day. Okay. Nosotros sabemos que fue el que lo mató.